بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد we spoke about aswad al ansi and how he was dealt with by the muslims after him there were a number of other imposters as well and what had happened after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away is that a number of different tribes who had just come into islam after the conquest of makka some of them had come under the name of islam or the banner of islam purely for the sake of expedience just so that they could be with the kind of stronger force of the muslims so that they would be protected from being attacked by them or they could benefit from being with them so many of them had not really converted they just shown their allegiance in a sense and they kind of expressed their faith so some of them were like that others they just done it because of following somebody else so they were not really serious about their faith and they just come into islam recently when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away the the true iman had not yet entered into their hearts yet and they hadn't learnt enough or some of them were just mischief uh, just uh, mischievous so after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away there were a number of different things that happened in the surrounding areas some people just completely left islam some people said we'll accept islam but then you know we won't give zakat so they tried to personalize their faith for example for example there was one whose name was malik and he was considered a tax collector i mean because he was one of the chiefs of his tribe and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had made him the tax collector he had embraced islam during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he was the tax collector for his area zakat and so on and so forth and he did it honestly so he was an honest person very very generous person as well he would keep the light on in his house at night time so that anybody who's traveling around would be able to see that light and they would come and he would host them so he was a very very generous and hospitable man but and in the beginning he was very honest in the way he collected the taxes and had it delivered to Medina Munawwara but what had happened is when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was ill he just collected the tax and then he heard that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had passed away so for some reason or the other he decided that he's going to go and give this money back to everybody and said look now you enjoy your money you don't need to pay it anymore so he never he didn't necessarily claim profitude or anything of that nature but he decided to cut away from medina so he had his own kind of group and he uh, made some agreements with some of the other tribes now you remember you have to remember that also among these tribes who had just come into islam there was still a very strong tribal mentality in the sense that they still had a lot of grudges and grievances against certain other tribes and maybe the tribe that they had some grudge or grievance against may have been good muslims so you've got now a really a cocktail of problems brewing up because you've got people who've either completely rejected islam because now they've seen that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has passed away so there's no need to go under that name there's others who actually felt that okay the prophet's gone then you know we don't need to be muslim anymore there's others who said that we are muslim but we're not going to do this that or the other then there were a few random here and there that actually considered themselves to be prophets so we would you know since the main one has gone the main prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has gone and they saw the benefit of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they saw his influence they saw what he could achieve and so on so they thought oh, great that's a good game and you know we should be able to get that influence as well most of these were very competent people these were not necessarily just anybody off the street trying this most of these were leaders of their people very endowed people people who had either wealth or people who had a lot of influence or people who were very strong so th- these were people like that some of them probably just to uh, bolster their position that i can be a prophet then people actually listen to me more than if i was just the king or the chief of them and some of them it was this, uh, you know all of them obviously but some 
would actually have the shaitan speak to them like Musaylama. He would constantly be listening out to the shaitan to say something. And he would think that Jibreel comes to him. Just like a few others as well that he is receiving revelation. Because that was part of what they'd seen with the Prophet wasallam that he would receive prophethood. So they had to do the same thing. And then who would speak to them? The shaitan would speak to them. So that's what you had. So one of the false prophets who remained after Aswad's time, so these are the, the main three during the end of the Prophet ﷺ's time and just after were Musaylama, Aswad al-Ansi who we already discussed because he died before the Prophet ﷺ passed away uh, the last few days, that's when that happened. And there was Musaylama. Musaylama went to Medina in a delegation from his people and his tribe had accepted Islam. And then they turned back afterwards. Now Tulayha, he was one of the false prophets as well. And he was one of the first to have the major clash with the Muslims. His name was Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid, chief of the tribe of Banu Asad. So this was a big tribe. And he had a history of opposing the Muslims. And he was like a little irritant. His army of small, small group of people who tried to go and attack the Muslims here, there and the other. And they would always get knocked back. They would always be defeated. But he kept springing back up to go and do something. First, he showed his hostility to Islam about three months after the Battle of Uhud. So it was really early on in Medina Munawwara. Now, he thought that, you know, if you remember during the Battle of Uhud, Muslims had kind of suffered a slight setback before they actually won the victory or there was maybe a tie or whatever the case was. If you remember when Khalid bin Walid came round when he was still part of the Meccans and one of the Sahaba had to actually stand with 50 people and to protect the mountain but they thought the battle was over so they moved away and then Khalid struck from the side so there was a kind of a setback so he thought this Tulayha thought he wasn't part of that battle but he thought the Muslims had been weakened by that so he got his clan together with the intention of raiding Medina big ambitions right? big ambitions but the Prophet Sallallahu came to know about this and before he, before Tulayha could even do anything else the horsemen of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were on him and they, they had to just scatter without a fight so his people had to just scatter without a fight and the Muslims captured their flock the flock that they had you know when they would go into these battles they had a lot of flock and the sheep and many other things many valuables and things like that which they would need to uh, fight their war with and for their supplies and so on so that was all captured by the Muslims and they went back to Medina uh, with them now this obviously caused a lot of discredit in the eyes of his people for Tulayha you know where did you take us into you know we couldn't do anything then after that, there was the battle of the trench, the ditch, the khandak, if you remember. That was a major battle. And that, the other name for that is called the battle of the Ahzab. There's a whole surah in the Quran about uh, Surah Al-Ahzab. The reason why it's called Ahzab, Ahzab is the plural of Hizb. Hizb means a group. Ahzab means the different groups. This was one of the biggest battles that was fought in the, Arabians, in the Arabian Peninsula until then. This was the biggest force that had come against the Muslims and in fact it was one of the biggest ever fights. It never really turned into a major fight because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had it averted because of strong winds that blew and the trench that the Muslims had dug. But it was one of the biggest ones and how that had taken place is that the leaders of many of the disbelieving tribes had gotten together that look we alone cannot do this we all have to get to it. So they rallied many of the tribes that were not under Islam. They rallied them against the Muslims. And they thought this consolidated attack would be able to finish off Medina. But the Prophet ﷺ had dug this ditch on one side. And, and then after that, a severe wind that really like uprooted many of the tents of the non-Muslim uh, camp caused them to, to go back. So there wasn't a major fight at that time. But Tulayha took part in that as well. After that, when no battle took place, they went back to their play, they, you know, they went back to their area. So again, Tulayha didn't get anywhere in this one either. 
The next occasion was against when there was a campaign against the Jews of Khaybar. And the Prophet Wasallam had the campaign against the Jews of Khaybar in the 7th Hijri. The Banu Asad again in this case under Tulayha, they sided with the Jews and tried to help them. So they, the Jews were obviously in their major forts and Tulayha was coming from his area. So Tulayha fought a number of small engagements and skirmishes before that battle. But he was defeated or rooted every single time. And then he noticed that he's not going to get anywhere. So he went back and he deserted the Jews that he had made an agreement with because he saw that he's not going to get anywhere. So he had this thing to just fight with the Prophet ﷺ, fight with the Muslims. Now two years after that, when it was, that was in the ninth Hijri when many wufud came, wufud are delegations. So as I said, many of the tribes now began to send delegations to the Prophet ﷺ to express their faith, to get further instructions, to get guidance, to take somebody back with them to, to study under. So this was called the, the year of the delegations. The delegations from the different tribes came. So the Banu Asad sent a delegation to Medina which offered their Islam to the Prophet wasallam. The whole tribe accepted Islam. But again, like many other tribes, this was not... They only did this as a matter of convenience, it seemed, just to be part of the ruling force or the strongest and dominating force. So, Tulayha, as part of that tribe, normally in those days, if a tribe accepted Islam, everybody did in that tribe. It was just a way to do it. You know, there was no individualism. It was all tribalism at that time. Right? So, Tulayha also outwardly embraced Islam. Now, that they were Muslims, he was still their leader, he became even more famous, and he used to do soothsaying. He was, used to foretell certain things and tell people about certain things that they didn't know about. So he had a lot of influence in that regard as well. He, could, he claimed to foretell the future as well, did a lot of kind of uh, clairvoyance, saying things about things that people didn't know about, and he was also a very good poet. During the illness of the Prophet wasallam, at the end, in fact, just a few days before the Prophet wasallam passed away, this Tulayha saw the perfect chance. He saw the Prophet wasallam is ill, very ill. He declared himself a prophet. And he told his people to follow him. Now remember, their, we, their iman was not, it was just a matter of political, it was a political move. And thus, if their leader is saying something, they will follow it. Now when they heard about the Prophet ﷺ passing away, he intensified his efforts. So because of that, many people began to, many of his tribe, many more members of his tribe, so-called apostate, uh, apostatized from Islam, turned away from it and began to follow him as the Prophet. This was also the time when now just after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passing away, many other tribes began to give up their Islam or do these strange things. So now what Tulayha did is that because they had embraced Islam officially, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had sent a tax collector, a person who's going to stay with them and he's going to collect their taxes and send them back. He was sent back, he was expelled. That, okay, we don't need you anymore, we're not Muslims anymore, you know, we're the Prophet, I'm the Prophet now. And he was sent back. Obviously, as a prophet or claiming to be a prophet as such, he had to do certain things to establish his position, make people really believe him to be the prophet of Allah. So the only way he could do that was by, he, th- it was, he said, you know what we'll do is that the salat, prayer, namaz, salat, it'll no longer have any sajda in it. You won't have to prostrate anymore. So the salat will now be without a prostration. Allah does not want you to uh, want us to invert our faces, he said, or bend our backs in an ugly posture. Just pray standing now. So he had to come up with something new. Now, if people believed him to be a prophet, they'd obviously believe that that's all they had to pray. So it doesn't seem far fetched, does it? So now that's how they prayed. He received a lot of help. Uh, sorry, he received a lot of offers of support from some of the tribes around him. Because they also, some of them had a grudge against Medina. 
So they thought, great, you know, we need to get together alone. We're not going to be able to do anything. So again, a matter of po uh, political diplomacy or um, expediency, they began to rally with him. Now, one of the staunchest of the, his allies were the tribe of Ghatfan. It was a very big tribe, the tribe of Ghatfan, very big tribe, and they became allied to him. He also had some help from the Hawazin. These were the people of Ta'if that had been, if you remember the battle after the conquest of Makkah when the Prophet ﷺ went to, uh, towards Ta'if and first he was showered with arrows and they felt a setback slightly. That was the tribe of the Hawazin. They also wanted to help him. And the Banu Sulaim, uh, Banu Sulaim. But they didn't support him as much. They kind of said, okay, we kind of, you know, we'll help you or whatever. But they didn't really support him as much. It was the Ghatfan which was really the big tribe that really supported him. Now, among the Ghatfan, the main one was, main, main person's name was Uyayna ibn Hisn. Uyayna ibn Hisn. And he was a very strange person actually. He was the chief of the Banu Fazara, which was one of the powerful clans of the Banu Ghatfan. So under the tribe of the Ghatfan, they had many different clans, and he was, one of the, he was the chief of the Banu Fazara, who were under the Ghatfan, Right, but he was he was their leader. But he's kind of a foolish kind of man, a kind of very strange kind of person in the way he would do things. He didn't really believe in Tulayha to be the prophet completely. But he again this was tribal mentality, he said, I would rather follow a prophet from an allied tribe than one from the Quraysh. So okay, if I have to follow a prophet, I'll follow this one. And then he says, well, Muhammad is dead, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to what he said. And Tulayha is still alive. So, now the thing is that by his support, the entire Ghatfan came to support Tulayha now. And it was going to be a severe pain in the side of the Muslim army. Or in, Madi in the side of the Muslim, uh, in the Muslims in general. So now he began his preparations to go out against Medina Munawwara. And kind of claimed the whole thing for himself. He sent his brother first to another area where there were some skirmishes, but there his brother was killed. Tulayha moved his army to a place called Buzakha, while his brother went in a different direction to help out somewhere else, but he was, he was killed. So Tulayha sent different envoys to the different clans around to join them many of them did support him because you know they had some grudge to to take care of so they this is all kind of get, just getting together to go out somebody else that they hated for whatever reason they didn't necessarily believe him but that's what the case was Oyeina brought about 700 people from the Banu Fazara then you know so you had the Banu Asid you had the Ghatfan then you had a contingent of Soldiers from the Banu Tay, the Tay tribe. So it was a very famous tribe. Now, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an is now being sent by Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an to all of these areas to sort the matter out. So the individual tribes, the small areas, the villages who had apostated from Islam, Khalid bin Walid had to go and deal with them. So he was going to have to deal with Tulayha now. First, Abu Bakr knew that this was a big army and they had a lot of clans that were going to support them, Tulayha. So rather than just send Khalid bin Walid like that, he thought that we're going to have to weaken their forces first, try to kind of split them up somehow. It's easier then to deal with them. Now he knew that the Banu Aswad, sorry, the Banu Asad and the Ghatfan, they were diehard supporters of Tulayha, so you couldn't really do much with them. But this small group of Tay that were going to support them, and Tay was actually closer to Medina, they, so that was going to be on their way. So if we deal with that, we'll be able to get to them. The, uh, we were going to be able to get to Buzakha more easily. Now, one of the chiefs of the Tay was a person called Adi ibn Hatim, radiallahu an. He was a devout Muslim, and he had initially tried the whole tribe of the whole tribe had been Muslim before 
and when they had apostated afterwards, Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu had tried to convince them that look, this is the wrong thing you're doing. Muhammad sallallahu is the true prophet. You can't do this, and so on. But they'd renounced him, and he had have to he had to leave the the tribe with a small group of people to join the Khalif Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So Abu Bakr radiallahu night now tried to get him to go back to them to try to talk to them because at the end of the day they were his tribesmen and he may be able to convince them to come away from this Tulayha and not help him. So Khalid bin Walid radiallahu went with 4,000 men and he went after dealing with the Tay Khalid bin Walid had Adi ibn Hatim with him after dealing with Tay he was instructed that the next place he was going to go to was Buzakha to deal with Tulayha there but first he had to deal with Tay to get that out of the way. So when they got to the Tay, Adi radiallahu went up and tried to speak to them. He was very eloquent, he was very forceful, but they would not listen to him. He talked about the hereafter, he talked about the fire of hell, he talked about good virtue and so on, and just leave this alone. But they, they, they rejected him. That's when Adi warned that, okay, see they didn't know this until now. He said, then be prepared to meet an army that comes to destroy you and take your women. Uh, take your women, saying that really gets them all fired up. Because they don't want any harm to come to their women. So this is an expression that they use. That you die, your women will be taken. So that really like, makes them think and kind of come down from their arrogant position. Do as you please, he said. That had the desired effect. So then they be, the, the, the leaders of the tribe, they began to really think. They said, okay, fine. Can you keep this army away from us? Because what's happened is, remember the whole of the Tay tribe had not gone. They were supportive of Tulayha, but the whole of the tribe had not gone to help him. A small group of people had. Now they knew that if they, the, the leader said, that keep this army away from us, we're going to try to go and take back our men from there. But if we just turn away right now, our men who have gone there are going to be killed by Tulayha's army. So we have to extricate them first, then we can come back. So Adi radiallahu came back to Khalid bin Walid radiallahu and asked him, like, this is what the situation is now. Khalid bin Walid you know, didn't want to waste time with all of these long negotiations. And because you know, he really had a thing about apostasy, but he said, um, Adi radiallahu wanted three days. And he said, I'll get... The benefit of it is that we, you'll get 500 warriors from this. So he showed Khalid the Allah and that look, there's benefit in this. And the other main thing is that it's better than sending them to the hellfire. Because if we go there, we're going to walk over them. And they're going to be killed, they're going to be going to the hellfire. So this way it's better, give them some time. So he gave them, I think, two days or maybe three. And the elders of Tay, they sent a detachment secretly to go and join with this group of in, uh, Tulayha and work, they, they couldn't openly come back or bring their people back but they said that they're going to work underground secretly to take their people away and they, they managed to do that so that's why they did not take part then in the battle of, uh, of Buzakha now in the meantime while this negotiation was taking in their two or three days were taking place, there was another tribe close by that had also apostatized, a smaller group. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an turned his attention to that side and he dealt with them. Now, he was about to attack them when again Adi radiallahu an came and said that, you know what, let me go and speak to them and see if they can, if we can avoid the bloodshed, if they will just come back. So alhamdulillah, Adi radiallahu when he went, they, he, they were convinced, they all submitted, and now 1,000 of them joined in the army of Khalid bin Walid. So now he's uh, 1,000 men more stronger. So he had 500 from, uh, horsemen from the Tay and 1,000 extra men from, the, from this other tribe. He was a lot more stronger than he had when he had left Medina Munawwara. A day's march from Buzakha, Khalid radiallahu sent two scouts to go and check out on a, recon, uh, on a mission to go and check out what's going on. Now that's where they met this brother of Tulayha, Hibal. 
and they killed him. So Tuleho was very strong. Remember I told you that one of his brothers were killed? This is where they were killed. This is where he was killed. So Tuleho got very angry. He sent another brother, Salma, uh, another brother of his. And in this case, Tuleho went as well. And Tuleho was a very good fighter in this case. When Khalid got to Buzakha, he stayed at a short distance away from where the other the apostates had encamped. The apostates were not fighting in their own land, they'd just moved out to this place. So when Khalid got there, he was camped nearby. Now the stage obviously was 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 set. Khalid had about six thousand men with him. And Tulayha is supposed to have had a larger enemy, a larger army. We don't know the exact numbers, but he was supposed to have a larger, a larger army than the Muslims, six thousand. Now Khalid the Allah, he would always fight in person. He wasn't one to sit in a camp, in a tent somewhere, and just give orders. He would actually fight in the thick of the battle, in the front of the battle. So Tulayha, though, he sat in a, he sat in a tent, in meditation. And told this Uyayna ibn Hisn, the leader of the Banu Fazara, and he made him the commander, that he had to lead the army. He was wrapped in a scarf, cloak draped over his shoulder, and he said, I'm going to be receiving revelation from Jibreel, alayhi salam. And I'll be telling you what to do and how to go about this. So as soon as the battle began, Khalid launched an attack on the, the front part of the, uh, the, the front of the forces. And initially the apostates, they did resist very stubbornly, especially the Banu Fazara. But then after that, as the pressure began to hit home with them, this Uyayna, who got now frightened of the severity of this attack, he went, rode to Tulayha's tent, and he says, has Jibril come to you yet? He says, no, no, no. So Uyayna went back to the battle. Again, some more time passed, and... Khalid was making radiallahu was making more headway into it and Uyayna again went to Tulay and said has Jibril come to you yet no by Allah replied the imposter he hasn't come yet so he went back now the Muslims are seeing victory now because you know they're really making a headway into uh, into the other uh, towards the other side and they were gaining more ground but this time Uyayna went for the third time to Tulayha and obviously now he was very impatient. What's going on? Where's this, you know, where, where's this prophecy that you keep talking about? And he said, has Jibril come to you yet? The imposter this time, he said, yes. What did he say then? Oyeyna asked. So Tulay is very calm. It looks like he's in this meditation. Shaitan speaking to him. I don't know who's speaking to him. But he's like really acting the, po- the part. Very calm as well. He's not getting flustered at all. He's saying, he said, you have a hand mill just like his. What's that got to do with anything? You have a hand mill just like his. That's what Jibreel said. And this is the day that you will not forget. You have a hand mill like his, and this is the day that you will not forget. Oyena just exploded. And that's when the veil fr- fell from his eyes. Remember, he was a foolish man. But now the veil fr- fell from his eyes that what is all this about? So he said, this is a day that you shall never forget. You will certainly not forget this day. And then he dashed out to his clan, the Banu Fazara. He said, oh Banu Fazara, this man is an imposter. Turn away from this fight. So that was, remember, they were the strongest contingent there. They were the bravest of the people there. As soon as he said that, they, they walked away. Now the people, the apostates began to just fall rapidly. One after the other. Muslims were just cutting them down. And some of them went back to Tulayha, ran to him and said, what are your commands now, Tulayha said. Uh, sorry, uh, they said. Tulayha's reply was, let those who can do as I do and save themselves and their families. So now he's just, go and save yourself. Now, he had his wife with him and he'd kept this camel ready. So he quickly jumped on and they ran. They, they, they took off. They, they took off, so deserted his men. Now the battle was over. And this was the second most powerful army was now defeated. So first it was Aswad, now Tulayha was defeated. Tulayha went to the borders of Syria. He went and began to reside in the Banu Kalb. 
his days as a false prophet was obviously, were obviously over. He probably lost a lot of respect among his, uh, among his tribe as well. Banu, then he heard that Banu Aswad came back under Islam. They, they reconverted to Islam. And the thing is that he also then converted to Islam. After that, he also converted to Islam and went and rejoined his tribe. He even visited Makkah during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, but Abu Bakr then didn't really take any notice of him. And after that, about two years after that, during the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, he went back and when Umar, uh, on seeing him, Umar radiallahu anhu said that you've actually killed two very prominent Muslims, Ukasha ibn Mihsan, and by Allah, I shall never be able to love you for that. Now, Tuleha was very clever. You know, he, he knew how to speak. He said, Allah blessed them with the paradise by my hand. Because they were made shaheed. And I did not benefit by their hands. They benefited from my hands because they were killed by me. And I seek forgiveness from Allah for that. I mean, he had a point in a sense. right? So Umar tried again. You lied when you said that Allah would do you no harm. Meaning that was some of the things that he would say before as a so-called prophet. So Tudayha says that, yeah, that arose from the mischief of disbelief which Allah has now destroyed. That was all the mischief of my disbelief that I had, but Allah has destroyed that. I cannot now be blamed for it. So Umar saw, Umar the saw that he's not getting very far with him. So he said, oh trickster, what remains of your clairvoyance? You know, what other prophecies do you give? What remains of that? So he said, nothing but a gust or two from the bellows. So obviously he was trying to get a bit smart as well there. But he lived with them. He lived with his tribe, went back to his tribe, lived there. And then in order to prove himself, he volunteered for when the Iraq, uh, when the Persian against the Persian army, the war against the Persian army was being fought in Iraq. He volunteered for that. And mashallah, he served with some kind of distinction. He did. Uh, he, he really showed his valor then, and he was. He took. Pa- uh, he took part in the, some of the big battles that time. The, some of the big battles are the Qadisiya battle, the Nahawan battle. He took uh, there. That's when he died a martyr. He he was shaheed. So, I guess as a shaheed, he earned his forgiveness. Inshallah. Anyway, after uh, after he had run away, Khalid radiallahu anhu had sent people, uh, had sent his army to deal with the rest of them and uh, he dealt with them he carried on, went to different areas um, and carried on now there's a number of other things that Khalid bin Walid did in between but what I want to speak about is about Musaylama now because that was the next big battle that had taken, that took place I spoke to you about Malik. Malik ibn Nuwayra, his name was. He was the chief of the Banu Yarbur, which was one of the, uh, one of the pow- a large section of the powerful tribe of Banu Tamim. It was another very powerful tribe. They were kind of closer to the Persian lands. And that's why some of them had embraced Zoroastrianism, which is like fire worship. And Malik married one of the most beautiful women of that area. Now, it was during the year of delegations that I mentioned, the Amul Wufud, as we call it. The tribe of Banu Tamim also embraced Islam at that time. So, Malik also became a Muslim. The Prophet Wasallam had, had, because of his position in his tribe, the Prophet Wasallam made him the collector for the zakat and for the sadaqat. And as I said, he was quite honest in the beginning and everything. And then after the Prophet Wasallam passed away, he decided to go back to his people and give them all the money back and say that your wealth is now our own and we don't need to give it. So basically he had apostatized in that sense. So just leave that on the side for now. There was now a woman. Her name was Sajjah or Umm Sadira. She is the daughter of Haris, born in a family of chiefs. So, you know, she was chief material, in a sense. She, had, she actually had the qualities of leadership, uh, 
big personality, very intellectual, and there were very few women that had been seen like her. She was also set to predict some future events. You know, I guess they would just say stuff people were interested in, like what was to happen, and then some of it would be right and people would believe her. Because, you know, if you say about ten different things about what's going to happen tomorrow, three or four of them might come right. But that's just a fluke, isn't it? So, uh, and some people are just a bit better in seeing the trend and the way things are going. It doesn't mean that they know the future, right? So it's just, okay, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, you know, ten things to say, three of them might be right, so people will listen to you. She was very poetic. So any, if, if she ever spoke to you, she would speak in, 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 uh, in rhyme. So if you said something, her response would be in poetry. So she could just have a casual conversation in poetry. That's how good she was in that sense. She had initially become a Christian due to her mother's influence, who was a Christian, but she wasn't really like into Christianity as such. She hadn't really, she'd just become a Christian because of her mother. Now, when apostasy began to spread, Sajja heard that, oh, there's some other prophets have come up. Tuleyha and Musaylama had proclaimed their prophethood. She heard about that and she thought, why only men? You know, I, I'll try my hand at this as well. So, why can only women be prophet? Why can only men be prophets? So she was very adventurous at heart. So she decided, and she said, "I'm a prophetess." And she elucidated that point, meaning she explained that point with some poetry. And her mother's clan began to accept her as a poet, a prophetess. She got together an army and came down into Arabia, came down to her father's tribe. Now her father's tribe, person of that same tribe was that Malik. Malik ibn Nuwayra was part of her father's tribe. Now she managed to get other people to support her and again it was just about getting back at people so they, some people, some tribes supported her. Now she was very happy that she'd got all of these different tribes together to help her so she went to Malik and she said look I've got no aggression against you we just want us, ourselves to work together the land is all yours and I'm just a woman of the Banu Yarbu tribe the land is going to be yours I don't want the land but we j I just want us to support each other against our common enemies now Malik wasn't a very warring person he'd apostatized but he wasn't a very warning, a warring person so it seems like he may have kind of toned her down a bit in you know, not, not letting her kind of advance. Now, they did fight though the surrounding areas to settle old scores. That has nothing to do with Islam or whatever. But now, because they'd come kind of together, they had the forces of both their armies. They managed to deal with a lot of, settle a lot of old scores and get, regain, regain their uh, power over that area. Then Sajja, who was more uh, adventurous than that, she, came, she, she went to another area where she began to plunder that area, but there she suffered a setback. So she was attacked, and the local clan, they united against this, this um, terrible lady uh, that they thought, who is this that's come and is doing all of this? So... Her, some most important people in her group were, were captured by them and they refused to let them go unless she promised to get out of the area and stop messing there so she agreed to do this now the thing was all her people now gathered together and the main ones came to her and said where do we go now? where's the next one? because you know, she was far from her hometown where do we go now? so said we're going to go to Yamama no, who lived in Yamama? That's Musaylama's base. We're going to go to Yamama. Now they're just looking at her in disbelief. What are you going to go do in Yamama? We haven't been able to do anything here. Musaylama's got a massive army. How are you going to go and deal with them? And she said, to Yamama. Onward to Yamama with the flight of soaring pigeons where the fighting is the fiercest and no blame shall fall upon you. Onward to Yamama. 
That was all done in poetry. Now, let's talk about Musaylama. Musaylama, son of Habib, his name was, of the Banu Hanifa tribe. One of the largest tribes of Arabia, inhabiting an area called Yamama. Very powerful people. Now, the thing is that the first time you hear about Musaylama as such is in the 9th of Hijri, the year of the delegations, as we called it. Remember, these are all from the outward, uh, all from the kind of outlying tribes and villages and areas. So, this when we first hear about him in the ninth, he came with a delegation from his tribe, the Banu Hanifa, to Medina Munawwara to the Prophet. ﷺ. He actually came. And there were two other prominent men with him of his tribe. When they arrived at Medina Munawwara, Musaylama was the one who stayed back to look after their camels and belongings while the rest of the tribe went to the Prophet ﷺ to speak to him and to embrace Islam. Now, Prophet ﷺ used to give them gifts to these tribes, to these delegations. He gave them gifts. And they said, oh, when they were being given gifts, they said, oh, we've got another man who's standing, who's staying with our stuff. Trying to say, like, you know, we need something for him as well. So the Prophet ﷺ made a kind of comment which he then used to his benefit. He said something like, he is not the least among you and sh- he should stay behind to guard... No, because he stayed behind to guard your stuff and your possessions and the property, he's not the least of you. Don't think like just because he stayed back that he's like the most humiliated of you. So on the return, the Banu Hanifa, this new faith of Islam was established among them through these delegates. They built a masjid in Yamama and they started making salat there. It was all fine. Some months passed and this was before now the Prophet ﷺ. Tulayha did it afterwards towards the illness time but Musaylama did it a bit earlier that Musaylama he apostated and he proclaimed his own prophethood. He didn't say I'm not a Muslim anymore he just basically said I'm a prophet which makes him an apostate. I'm a prophet. I have been given a share with him in this matter, with the Prophet ﷺ in this matter. And then he said, Did he not say to our delegates that I was not the least among them? And this could only mean that he knew that I had a share with him in this matter. Now where he's connected this statement to being a prophet, subhanallah. Now the thing is that he was a very clever man. He could show many tricks. And he had these funny things that he used to do. For some reason, he could actually put an egg in, into a bottle without it breaking. And the bottle had a you know, narrow neck. So that was something strange. He could take off all the feathers of a bird and put them back on the bird could fly. Do some silly things like that. Now the thing is that he had this thing of composing. And maybe I'll read out some of those to you afterwards. You know, obviously people are saying, well, there's revelation the Quran is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad and what about you? So he would come out with these really, really funny compositions that sounded like Alam Tara Kaifa Fa'ala Rabbuka bi Ashab al Feel, but would have some really simpleton kind of really strange meanings. And you know, I'll I'll read some of those out to you afterwards. So that that he would say, Well, this is the revelation that I get, this is my Quran that I have. Most of what he said was about animals. I mean, he just seemed to love animals, talk about animals, talk about women, talk about his tribe. So most of the stuff related to those kind of things. He said, Allah has blessed my wisdom. It is as strong as the gust that blows from between the belly and the intestines. What's that got to do with anything? The people, as I said, people, they marvel at, they become blinded. They become blinded. They would marvel at his wisdom. And they accepted him as the Prophet. Now his influence is growing day by day. Then one day in the 10th Hijri, before the Prophet ﷺ passes away, he wrote to the Prophet ﷺ, from Musaylama, Messenger of Allah, to Muhammad, Messenger of Allah, salutations to you. I have been given a share with you in this matter. Half the earth belongs to us and half to the Quraysh. 
But the Quraysh are a people who transgress. They want too much. They want more than. Isn't it supposed to be half off? Keep it that way. But you guys want more than us. That's what he's trying to say. So the Prophet ﷺ wrote back to him, In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, from Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, to Musaylama, the liar. <laughs> Salutations to whomever follows the guidance. Assalamu ala man al huda. Lo, the earth belongs to Allah. He gives it to whomever he chooses from among his servants. And the hereafter is for the virtuous. So from then he became known as Musaylama al kadhab the liar. Now, one of the two men from the Banu Hanifa, who I said they were prominent individuals, there were two, one of them, whose name was Ar-Rajjal, Nahar Ar-Rajjal, he moved to Medina, and he stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he showed that he learned a lot, and he learned a lot of Quran, and so on and so forth. And he became quite known. He... When he heard about Musaylama's mischief, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was, Yamam was too far away for a military expedition against them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided to do it in a different way. So, he sent this Rajala. But as soon as he got to Yamama, he declared that Musaylama is definitely the Prophet. Now obviously, him coming from Medina after having stayed there for a while, and his now support for Musaylama is going to obviously increase his influence. So now even larger groups of the Banu Hanifa began to believe in him as Musaylama, the messenger of Allah. So they formed this accursed partnership, we could call it. And he was the right hand man. Now when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Musaylama was able to overcome the entire tribe and people began to flock to him from the different areas. He made alcohol lawful for them. So now wine drinking was fine. That obviously increased his reputation and his influence among the people. He had some funny ideas about things, many of them, but we won't. But people began to believe that he had some kind of miraculous powers. Now, although all of the Banu Hanifa expressed their allegiance to him as the Prophet, they didn't all believe him. Again, this was just a matter of expediency that if your entire clan is believing something and you don't, you're going to be attacked. So, they kind of all just went along with it as such. So, for example, one man who was told to be a Mu'addin, Jubayr ibn Umayr, So he says, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. They would say, Ashadu anna Musaylama Rasulullah. I bear witness that Musaylama is the Rasul of Allah. So one day he's giving adhan, he'd say, I bear witness that Musaylama thinks he is the messenger of Allah. Now, about Musaylama, they say that he looked terrible. Very ugly man, short, statured, but very strong. Very good warrior, but very ugly. Small, close set eyes, flat nose. But he had this irresistible fascination for women. And he was very, very talented in getting them to do whatever he wished. He could just sweep women off, off their feet. You had to sit with him for a few minutes, and he would sweep, sweep them off their feet says that no woman left alone with him would be able to um, resist his devilish charm. Now this Sajjah, remember we were talking about Sajjah, and she says to your mama, like the, like the ways the, 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 the doves go. So Sajjah didn't know this side of him. So she went to your mama, Musaylama found out about it. Now, Musaylama is concerned because Khalid bin uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu an has sent Ikrima radiallahu an, the son of Abu Jal would become Muslim afterwards, to go against Yamama. That was the first contingent he had sent. Then another one, and then Khalid bin Walid was supposed to come. 
But the point of sending Ikrima was just to show that the Muslims were upon them so that Musaylama would not go anywhere and do anything. That he'd be waiting for them to attack. That was the reason for sending Ikrima. So this has already taken place that Ikrima was there, radiallahu an. Now he, Musaylama hears about this Sajjah marching from the other side and he's worried now that if he becomes locked in battle with Sajja, and then the Muslim army would attack, then he would lose because he's already, his focus is somewhere else. So how do I deal with this, he's reckoning. So when he heard about her coming and her march, he decided to neutralize her somehow, win her over somehow. So he quickly sent a message that, look, no need for you to come with your warriors. Come yourself first and we'll talk. You know, we'll negotiate. <clears throat> so she, very brave woman, she left with about 40 of her warriors to meet Musaylama. She got there to the gate of the fort. The fort was closed. And she received instructions that she had to leave her men outside and she had to come inside alone. So she left them outside and she went alone. Sorry, very brave woman. Musaylama had a very large tent pitched out there in the courtyard of his house. The weather was a bit cold, so he had it nicely warmed up. And he told his men to scent it, fragrance it with a special aphrodisiac scent. Right? For those who understand what an aphrodisiac is. Right? Just to kind of calm her nerves and make her relax. That's basically what's mentioned. Shed her inhibitions. And perfume has that ability. Uh, and certain things has that ability. So she went into the tent. She didn't know what she was going into. She, you know, she's very bold, very intellectual. You can imagine this very career-oriented woman who's been leading you know, a lot of men. So you, know, you can imagine she's going in and I'm going to deal with him as well. It's quite brave to go against Musaylama in the first place. Right? So now she's going all the way. So she entered the tent... And then Musaylama came in as well. Now they were alone. He began to speak and his spell began to work on this woman. He talked of Allah, of politics, of the troubles with the Quraysh and so on and so forth. And after that he said, you know, she used to claim prophethood as well. So he said, tell me some, about some of your revelations, some of the wahi that you receive. So she said, no, a woman should not begin. You tell me first what's been revealed to you. So, as he started giving his revelation, she's just gazing at him with adoration. Do you not see your Lord, he said, how he deals with pregnant women? He extracts a living being from between their belly and intestines. He's got this thing with belly and intestines. Right? I mean, he's just saying like some simple facts. He comes out with them as though there's some kind of revelation. And what more, she said excitedly. He has revealed to me that he created women a receptacle and created man as her mate to enter and leave her as, as his pleasure. And then a little lamb is brought forth. She was fascinated. She said, you're indeed a prophet. So Musaylama went close and said, do you want to marry me? And then with my tribe and your tribe, we'll just eat up the Arabs. You know, we'll just take care of them, all of them. She said, of course, yes, we'll do that. So she stayed with him for about three days, went back to her army. Now the thing is that she said, I found the truth and I've accepted him as a prophet and I married him. They're like, what did he give you as your dowry then? So she said, no, there was no dowry. <laughs> so she went back. That oh, my, my tribe aren't going to accept this unless I get a dowry. So she went back and it was locked. So he's, he, and he's asking from inside, what do you want? He said, well, this is the issue. He said, okay, go back and tell him that the wedding gift to you is that you must announce to them that I, Musaylama ibn Habib, the messenger of Allah, cancelled two of the prayers that Muhammad has imposed on them. Fajr prayer and one of the evening prayers cancelled. You only have to pray three prayers a day. So obviously she went back and now the thing is after that she didn't really do much. She went to Iraq afterwards. Because when she probably noticed that I can't be, he's more prophet than I am as such, according to her, she 
not sure exactly what happened. She went back to Iraq, where her father's side was from. And she had finished with politics now and prophethood. She decided to give up her career. And she went to her mother's tribe, lived there. And then after that, later she embraced Islam and was known to become, have become a very pious and virtuous woman. And during the caliphate of Muawiyah, she moved to Kufa where she died at an old age. So alhamdulillah, she became a Muslim. But that was a very critical moment because the people who had been close to the Prophet وسلم, they were still strong. But many of these new tribes that had come in, they didn't really have the faith. So that's why they began to apostatize. And if Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu did not take care of them, he had a major responsibility as soon as he took office. Major responsibility. If he let that fester, there would have been all sorts of things going on. So for the two years and some months that he was Khalif until he passed away, he was dealing with that. But alhamdulillah, by the end, he dealt with it. And he left it clean for Umar radiallahu an. And Umar radiallahu an came in and just built on it. And expanded it. So they say that Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And the two men, if you look in history, who came at a very critical moment and saved Islam from becoming different as such. One was Abu Bakr radiallahu an. The other one is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Abu Bakr radiallahu an dealt with all of these this apostasy and all of these, declar- uh, these claims to prophethood and so on, which would have really left the Muslim Ummah in disarray. Because if you're not united, and you've got these different kinds of Muslims as such, it's really disunity. Disun- so he dealt with that. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal dealt with it on a different level. His was more an ideological level. When the group called the Mu'tazila had influenced the, the rulers of the time, Ma'moon al-Rashid and Mu'tasim Billah, Abbas al-Khalifs, to persecute the people if they did not believe in what they claimed to be the truth about the, the, the nature of the Quran and there was massive persecution many ulama were killed, many ulama were pr- imprisoned, many had to just declare to them what they wanted to hear Imam Ahmad stood out and he refused and because of that the common people were saved from Islam turning into a different direction so what some ulama say that Abu Bakr actually had a whole army behind him with all the Sahaba, whereas Ahmad ibn Hanbal was a single man. So his what he did was even of a greater achievement in that sense. He's not superior to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, but in terms of what he was challenged with as a single individual, Abu Bakr would have done the same thing if he was single. But he had Umar and everybody behind him. In fact, if you look at Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he said, "I'm going to fight with these people until they come back into proper Islam." You can't fight with people if they're not Muslims to start with. Unless they aggress against you, then it's defense. Then, then it's just retaliation. But this issue was about the fact that if you become Muslim and then apostatize, that carries the death penalty in Islam according to the hadith. So because they negated or rejected actually a major aspect of Islam which is zakat, he said, I'm going to fight with them. Umar radiallahu an. I mean, he, before he said that he had expressed that he's going to go out against them, Umar radiallahu was quite surprised. Umar radiallahu who's always willing to go out and take these measures, he's surprised by Abu Bakr radiallahu He's saying, are you really going to do that? So Abu Bakr radiallahu said, absolutely, if they even withhold from me the small, like equivalent to a small stick, then that's withholding zakat. That means they're rejecting zakat. It's not that they just don't want to pay as laziness. They're rejecting it. It's not part of Islam. We will do that. So Umar radiallahu was convinced. So he had a tough job on his hand. Because Khalid bin Walid dealt with most of them. As you'll see from Musaylama's story as well, that he just went and cleared the whole mess up as such before uh, the forces towards Iraq during the time of Uthman radiallahu and Umar radiallahu an as well. So inshallah we'll cover that next time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, keep us united and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enliven the faith in our hearts and keep us on the deen. Allahumma and the salam, amin ka salam, tabarak the adil jalali wa ikram. Allahumma ya hayu ya qayyum, bi rahmatika nasagheeth. Allahumma ya hannanu ya mannan. 
لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا وحدنا ورزقنا اللهم اغفر لأمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر لوالدينا ولمشائخنا ولأساتذتنا ولطلابنا ولإخواننا ولأخواتنا ولأصدقائنا ولأزواجنا ولأولادنا ولكل من له حق علينا ولكل من أوصانا بالدعاء Oh Allah, accept our du'as. Oh Allah, accept our coming together in the masjid. Oh Allah, accept our forg- oh Allah, accept our istighfar and our repentance. Oh Allah, purify us of our sins. Oh Allah, purify us of our sins. Oh Allah, make sins hated in our eyes. Oh Allah, make them repugnant and ugly in our eyes so that we can abstain from them. Oh Allah, keep us united. Oh Allah, give us the strength of the deen, strength of iman. Oh Allah, give us the ability to follow the sunnah of your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, elevate your kalima la ilaha illallah. Oh Allah, make us the true carriers of this kalima la ilaha illallah, the true embodiment of that and the spirit of the deen. Oh Allah, make us true da'is and oh Allah, allow us to share this with others. Oh Allah, oh Allah, bring back humanity in us, grant us good character. Oh Allah, grant us true insight into the affairs. Oh Allah, grant us the ability to see the truth as the truth and to follow it and to abstain from the wrong and to see the wrong as the wrong. Oh Allah, oh Allah, shower your blessings upon us. Oh Allah, shower your mercy upon us. Oh Allah, help us in everything that we do. Oh Allah, oh Allah, for you it's easy. It's just a decree that you have to you have to make, O oh Allah, for us, it's a lifelong struggle. O oh Allah, make this easy for us and grant us the kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed. O oh Allah, grant us a place in Jannatul Firdaus and make all of the stages of the hereafter easy for us. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun al-mursaleen alhamdulillahi.